All right, Barb, thank you so much for, for being uh, here and spending this moment on that moment with me. So I want to I want to hop right into it, Barb. Um, you know, at a, at a at an age has been published already. You know, your your boyfriend or whatever left you. Your secretary. You borrowed a thousand dollars and you turn it into. And that's what I always say. Right? You turn it into a really big exit. Well, I was twenty three when I started the Corcoran Group, or the Corcoran Simone Company was my first business. And I was 29 when he married my secretary. By the way, Damon John, it's a pleasure to be here. You're my favorite shark. I think you're so handsome and brilliant. And I was really excited to talk with you today. You didn't give me a chance to say thank you for letting me come. That is impressive because I know that I am your favorite shark. I do know that. But all the rest of that, I, you, you have a very a great way of people either making people either feel like shit or feeling special. So <laughs> yes, you. it's so true. But you're always <laughs> in the good category. <laughs> <laughs> 29, Barb. What, you, you're at the point at 29 years old where I would think like most of the women that I met, they're saying, I have to really start considering what I'm going to do over the next five years because I want to probably be most likely be a mother. Man that I have, he left me. What was going on in your mind that made you feel like it's, you can do this? You can start your own business against those type of odds. I know you came from a family of 2,000 kids. <laughs> you exaggerate, my dear. 10 uh, kids. It seems like nothing by comparison. That's a, listen, if people don't know, Barbara did not grow up with a lot. She just grew up with a lot of siblings. That's all she had a lot of. And <laughs> that's not easy at that time. Even until today, women still get the short end of the stick. But at that time, you really got the short end of the stick. Being one of 10, being left, and more, more importantly, being insulted by being left by for somebody else that worked for you. What was going through your mind at that moment? Why would you decide that, no? you know what? I'm going to go out and conquer the world. Why? And what was going through your mind? You make me sound a lot better and stronger than I actually was. And thank you for having that confidence. But I did not own that confidence myself at the time. All I had in my mind was, is she prettier than me? <laughs> and she was. She was well, five years younger than me. He was 10 years older than me. So he was 15 years her senior, 10 years my senior. And she was a lot prettier than me and more charming. And that's the part that bugged me. I wasn't thinking about business. I wasn't thinking about children. I was just thinking, why would he pick her over me? And I was heartbroken and it blew my confidence. I really didn't have confidence for about a year until I just got mad enough. And it happened one day when I went in the office, I saw them holding hands in my old office and she took my desk, his idea, and they were giggling and looking at each other lovingly and hugging oh, each other. When I hear he left you for your secretary, it, it's not just like he left and ran off. They, no. they kicked you out or you left? No, he left me as my boyfriend, uh -huh. uh, but not as my partner. And he wouldn't let me fire the secretary because he said he was the majority owner, which he was. He owned 51 percent and he was in charge. And so I lived with the two of them for a year watching their happiness when I couldn't find a man to marry fast enough. Why did you stay? Was it because you didn't have any other options to leave? You weren't confident enough? Like, I think yes. that if you listen to that story, knowing the Barbara Corker now who's super successful, you would say a man right there in front of you, who's your boyfriend, marries your secretary. You guys are still partners and you didn't spit in his face or leave. What's wrong with you? There was a lot wrong with me. And the main thing was, remember, he had found me at a diner. He told me I could make something of myself, which I didn't know. He loaned me the thousand dollars to start the business. He believed in me. He took me out of my hometown of Edgewater into the big city. He made me a success or as I saw it, he made me the success. I was already very young and I thought I would be nothing without him. So it's easy to say, to kick up your heels and get the hell out of there. But it's something else to gather your skirts about you and get your confidence under you and walk out the door. I did not have that confidence. And I'm ashamed it took me a whole year, but at least I got to the point one year later of walking in one day and saying, we're ending this business today. At least I got to the point where I walked in one day and took control of the circumstance. Maybe a little late, maybe a year after a lot of broken hearts and tears, but at least I got there. And once I did, I worked like lightning speed to get rid of him, 
the company, chop up the company, get rid of the girlfriend and start all over again. Maybe I just need a little runway space. I don't know. I don't know if it, I don't know if it took too long, you said, because the question of that moment is, did he see more in you in the beginning when you were that waitress and he knew that whether he had a skill or not, he knew that you were kind of Luke, right? And and you all, you were, it was inevitable that you were going to be successful if somebody gave you a little bit more direction, but maybe he just gave you direction and sped up that success in one year or five years instead of 10. But a lot of people are in relationships, business relationships and personal relationships where they feel dependent on somebody else because that person mm -hmm. happened to be the first or your mother, I'm sure, and your family always have been supportive, but that person was the external person who first said, oh, I believe in you. But you yes. were already great. You say that. You didn't know me then. I wasn't so great. I was a poor student in school, much like you, Damon. I had never had a success ever in my life. And suddenly this great, cool guy, 10 years my senior, shows me the way in life. I well, mean, he saw something in you. He saw the, he saw something in you to not only see, there is a thing about a person coming into your life saying, I like you, be my girlfriend. There's a difference of, I like you, be my girlfriend. And let's start a business together because that's how much I believe you. That's night and day because if you would already believe that, he was such a great person, then you would have been with him anyway. You just would have been maybe working another restaurant, but in a bigger city. Consider this possibility. Let's say he looked at me as that cute little waitress with the pigtails and the bows on my thing, beautiful white virgin behind the counter, and said to himself, I bet she's great in bed. And maybe I was. And then eventually he said, you know what? If I want to keep this chick, I better give her some money and start a business. Maybe it went you like that. What? Because I know that you weren't great at bed. I, you, you talk so remember that, you remember that night. Thank God. I thought you forgot oh, about you it. Talk so, you're so bold that you can bet. <laughs> That's what I'm I'll see you in court, mister. <laughs> but... <laughs> What do, you, what do you think it was, Barb? We're going to get through this interview. I promise we're going to get through this interview. Without what, a lawsuit. I doubt it. Okay. What was what what was it then that he saw in you as you reflect on that? And let me ask you something. What You're interviewing the wrong person. You ought to have Ramon Simone on your show. <laughs> do you remember, Barb, when he broke up with you, what was the song at that moment that you healed I yourself with and listened to a thousand times? Do you remember? I don't remember hearing a song. I just remember working endless hours to hide myself in my work so I wouldn't have to feel the pain. That's all I recall. I had my own song. You could do it, Barbie Dolly. You could do it. You could do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the scars. I don't remember the song. I don't even think I had the radio on, for God's sakes. <laughs> scars run deep, Barb. Scars run deep. All right, Barb, let's get to the point. All right, that you we can change subjects, but let me just take a guess at what was in his head when he suggested I have a thousand dollars to start my business or our business. I just remember him saying, you have a fabulous personality. You'd be great in real estate sales. Why don't you start a business? It was as quick and instant and impressionable as that. And I said, sure, why not? I tried everything else. I've had 22 other jobs. I'll give that a shot. What the heck? I was more surprised than he was when I found out I was good at it. And it wasn't as though I was good at real estate. I'm still not even good at it. I don't really, I'm not that interested in real estate and really never have been. But what I'm really interested in is people. And from the get-go, I was so good with the few people we hired. And I think that's what got the whole shooting match going, rolling in the right direction. Was that something, were you in the 22 job? Were you good as a waitress? Were you good as various things? Did you make more money? Do you have more return customers, better tips and various things. As in always. Your I always made money as a waitress. I always made money in any kind of a sales front forward dealing with people position because I really love people, even the bad ones I love and I get a kick out of them. And so when you naturally like people, you tend to do well with them. You and I, are, we're both dyslexic. I think that a lot of people don't realize, I think it was eight of the 12 shots of dyslexic. You, myself, Kevin O'Leary, Richard Branson, I think Rohan and various others, but you have this, you have this ability to cut straight through to the core of something and either extract some value from somebody like 
the money doing the photo shoot. I've seen it a million times and you just say some crazy stuff to bring some joy out of them and make them the most pleasing thing. And th where does this kind of tunnel vision on what to extract, where does this come from? Because I always tell people, I'm a one trick pony. I get something, I license it, I put it on a star. I said, Barbara is the most brilliant marketing person I've ever met in my life because she can come out with, she can think of this, she can think of things out of the air, like, hey, EO or whatever is coming to town. I'm going to take them through the sewers of New York City. I'm going to, or, hey, you know, you're smart. You know, you're here. I can do something to make you smart. Get that best shot out of you. Or even when people think it's an insult and it's not. It's, oh, guys, I love the way that you look. Yeah, I know you sell a barbecue stuff, but you look like a pig. And the guy looked like a pig. That was pretty obvious. He looked like a pig, but a cute one. He, he did. But do you realize that? gift of yours or it just is so natural but you seem to home in on it do you realize that's a gift or no it's my secret sauce i stole it from my mother what my mother could do better than anyone i have ever met in my life is size people up and not size people up be careful of this guy don't trust him she had that too but she could look some somebody talk two minutes and say it's too bad they never went into the field of such and such they'd be great at it like how do you know you've never been in business but she knew it's too bad that little boy is so sad if only the mother had gotten him in the playground he would be great at sports and find his confidence eddie her husband eddie take him to the playground take that kid with you she was always great at putting her finger on what the gift of everybody was and blowing it up now about making people, to your reference a moment ago, about making people comfortable and bringing out the best in people, I can also intuitively feel people's insecurity always right away. So on a photo shoot or something, I know how to get around people to make them relax because I know what they're worried about. And I know how to shore them up and get them relaxed right away. And then the whole thing works for everybody. It's such so much more fun all the way around, right? It is until, as you have said yourself, it is until you stick your foot in your mouth because yeah. you've been very loose and very fun with people. And sometimes, even though you make a mistake at the moment and you even make it as fun, let's all enjoy it. And hey, I'm the one that stuck my foot in my mouth. How do you do that too? Because we're in a world where everybody gets offended so easily and you tend to not care because you know you're coming at it with a from a good place yes. and you'll you say things that you go oh, this and that you go oh my silly self whatever like how do people even how do you do that Did, was that something you had to learn or that was natural as well no that's just an attempt to have fun however i have a cautionary bone in me in social media you cannot do that you cannot be yourself in social media i edit myself before I open my mouth on social media or post anything, because I realize the danger of that loose lucidness that I have wouldn't be well received by maybe a minority of the people who are watching or listening, but nonetheless, you get buried with that stuff. So I'm very careful on social media, but on a one-on-one -on -one relationship in a crowd, out of work, kidding around, you get a chance to go around once, you might as well have the most fun going around, don't you think? And you're a good sport. And most people are good sports. They love to play. We're all children at heart and we're dying to have a good laugh. Don't you think? I think so. That's why we enjoy each other so much. So now all of a sudden your career is going and you're a career woman. And, and I know this, I want you to share the story of when you had your first child, you scheduled to have. You just went in and you made it almost like a meeting, right? To have your first child. Can you tell me the story of that? I was married to my first husband that I talked into taking me down the aisle, trying to beat my boyfriend and his girlfriend down the aisle. He won by two months. So I dragged this poor innocent guy from California down the aisle, married the guy. And then within a year, I realized it was a big mistake. It was a consummate marry on the rebound fast story. But anyway, he wanted to have children in the meanest way. And I never got pregnant for seven years. I never got pregnant. I'm thinking, dodge that bullet. But when I married my husband, Bill, I was a dog in heat and I wanted to have children right away. And I, I couldn't have them. And I forgot to tell you one little anecdote that you might find amusing. With my first husband, mm -hmm. my first husband was from California. Everything about him was like an old man. He smoked a pipe. He moved slow. He talked slow. He thought slow. He was smart. And anyway, I was convinced when we didn't have children after a few years, I said, 
The problem with you is your sperm is slow. I think you ought to go to a doctor and check out your sperm. I think they're not good swimmers. And he came back from the doctor and said, uh-uh, the doctor said, I'm fine. It must be you. And lo and behold, it was me. I subsequently left him thinking I had dodged a bullet not having children because that marries you to someone for life, I feel, in a weird way. And when I married my husband, Bill, who I married 35 years ago, I was dying to have kids. And Bill had already had kids, but he wanted to have kids with me. So I started seven years of in vitro to have children. Thank God it finally worked. It finally worked and I gave birth to my son, Tom. But by then I was 46, a little too late to have 10 kids, I think. But then 10 years later, I adopted, of course, Katie when I was 56. So I wound up with two children. I wish I had eight or 10 or 12, but at least I have two. And I'm thankful for that. <laughs> now, now, do you think that it was, it, was it, I guess it was because you really didn't love the guy as much as you didn't want children from him. But what was your career? Because at that time, the Corkman Group, you were probably, what was, what was the size of the business at that time when you were 40 years? How many employees did you have on the DT? I probably had maybe 250, 300 employees at, when I married my first husband. And then when I married my second husband, I probably had five, 600 employees. And so for all the yeah, career- I was working hard. I was working very hard. Listening to you right now, were you with the wrong person for the wrong reasons? Or was it because you just felt you were growing your business at 200? You didn't get to 500. You didn't know you were going to get to 500, but you were just so consumed with business. What, what was the reason why you didn't want to have children then? And then all of a sudden with Bill, you wanted to have children. You know what? It was false confidence. My mother had 10 kids. My sisters had three, four, five kids each. They had kids like rabbits. When they wanted to have children, they popped a few out. I figured being the daughter of my mother and father, I would be able to have as many kids as I want, as late as I want. I had full security. All right. But it wasn't until I got near 43, 44, 45 that I started thinking maybe I would never have children. That's why it seemed like a miracle when I did. But I'm not sure I really answered your question on that one. Did I marry the wrong guy? Yes, I did the first time, but he served a purpose. He brought me over troubled waters. When not, That was a song out then that I remember, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. And I would always think he took me away from the boyfriend that left me and he comforted me. He was so kind hearted and took care of me and mended me, really lovely man, except it wasn't the kind of thing that could be a life partner. It wasn't for me until I met Bill. And then I was crazy enough to sign up for that guy. Oh, my God. I should have gone to a psychiatrist and had my head examined. It was a challenge of a lifetime <laughs> compared to my first husband. But I guess I like challenges because I like Bill an awful lot. <laughs> I think Bridge Over Trouble Water is a perfect song because when I was first coming up and FUBU was starting, and as Cuban would say, girls would say, it's FUBU or me. I was like, I forgot what was your name again. <laughs> but, I, but I met this feisty woman who was just really great. And I was at the time of my life when I was risking everything. I was already what I felt very similar to you. I was 26, 27 years old. I was proud to say that I wasn't one of the young men who had babies under age. I was being very careful with what I was doing. I had everything at risk. And the last thing I needed to do was get married and or have children when I have this thing called food with me. Actually, after eight years of putting everything in, I may see some light. And then all of a sudden, it's, no, I, I have to have this woman. I have to have children with her. Let me have that healthy, that, not healthy. It's a little bit of a balance on what life and what God puts in your way. Or, and that's the way I'm going to say it. But so now all of a sudden, it's interesting. You, you probably have told the story of giving a percentage away to a great worker of yours who helped scale the business. You scaled the business. When you sold the company, the business, were you excited about selling it? What was your reasoning? Did you get a, the number you wanted? You got a number that surpassed it. What did you have drive afterwards? I'm just curious because they say that about one third of people die five years after retiring or sell their wow. business. Oh, Selling well, the, the business or after retiring? There's a different age. Or selling the business. Now, the stat could be skewed because they could have been sick, and that's why they sold, but they could have, mm -hmm. they've also said that there was no drive, and you start drinking, or you don't have purpose. How did you feel after selling the business, and what, was it, what did it feel like that moment when you either got that check or got that wire? How did you feel that moment? 
Were you scared? Were you happy? Were you confused? Well, it was chopped. The decision to sell my business was so simple. It was like adding one and one equals two. I was adding up the numbers one night, studying my market share as against my competition. I've been creeping up the ranks. I was the lowest on the totem pole. And then I was number seven. Then I was number six and number three, the number two. And I was breathing right down the biggest competitor's neck, which was Douglas Elliman at the time. Yeah. And then one night I did the numbers with my partner, Esther, who was my 10% partner. We added them up and clear as a bell, we were number one. And I said, let's sell this joint. Oh. He was like, what? And I said, yeah, I reached my goal. I'm the number one broker in New York. What am I going to work for? Let's sell this joint. She goes, how are you going to do that? I said, we'll figure it out. We both went home that night. The next morning, made a few phone calls, and within about three months, the shop was sold. It was quick, fast, and furious. Oh. About the purchase price, which was, I think, the more interesting part of the story, when I got my first offer from the loan buyer, they offered me $22 million. Mm. And I was on a chair going up a ski run with my brother, my younger brother. And I said, I just got a $22 million offer. He said, what did you tell him? He said, 20 million, do you know what $22 million is, Byron? Could you imagine $22 million, $22 million. We were the richest people on that chairlift in the world, okay? Even though we didn't have our money on the 22. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I told them I'll take 66. He said, why 66? I said, it's my lucky number. <laughs> and some of them, they eventually paid 66 a month later. They kept upping it. I kept firm until they hit 66. I said, I'll take it. But I had a little, a good luck and bad luck rolled into one. So far it was all great. And then I sold the contract Friday night before 9-11. I remember my new CEO who I had put in place called me and said, it's 1130, all the attorneys and accounts have to go home, we'll resume on Monday. And I am the nicest, easiest going boss. And I said to her, nobody's going home till that deal is done. She was in Westchester County. And she said, no, we'll just, we'll, would they, we all clear our calendars first thing Monday morning. I said, no, sign it tonight. Nobody goes home till it's signed. Mm. And they worked till one in the morning, got it signed. And on Monday, 9-11 happened. Wow. Boy, was that lucky that I got that signed. But unfortunately, mm. in that first week, no one would return my phone call. The acquirer disappeared off the face of the earth. Such silence. And I realized the deal was never going to close. It was just never going to happen. And I went and visited him and closed the deal. I won't tell you the details on that, but I closed the deal and thank God I got the $66 million about two weeks after 9-11. But you asked me another, I think I dropped a piece of your question. What was no, 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 that, that's amazing. And now all of a sudden, because I think one of the top questions that I'm asked, or I'm sure you are the same thing, two or three always work like balance, but then people are like, when do I take in an investor and how do I know when it's time to sell? And that's all a very personal matter to people each individual it sounded like your you had two personal things you had number one we're number one so i'm done let's get it over with because you wanted to prove something to somebody whether it's yourself or the world myself i reached my goal what was i going to work on i don't know I, because other people would say now that i've reached this level of success and i'm so happy and i'm pulling my i mean you may have been pulling money out of the business they go what am i going to do after because this is all i know how to do but then you also had another number too you had number one and you had 66 and if they were both met it sounds like you exited what happens next that you have this money because you're a very active person were you able to shift this into the things you love buying privately i'm sure you got a non a non-compete or did you sit around and go, what the hell am I going to do now? I'm trying to understand what did that, after you got that check, how did it feel for the next six months? I'll tell you how it felt immediately and then how it felt one week later. How it felt immediately was like the Catholic miracle my mother always told us we would get if we were really good kids. <laughs> like it finally happened. Catholic miracle happened. And the morning after, actually not Saturday morning, Monday morning with 9-11, I went to the Citibank, which was still open, and I got a check, not a check, I got my little cash card for $200. I always got $200 every Monday. And when it went to chit and gave me my receipt, it said I had $66 million in my account, my checking account. I was like, ah! <laughs> it was such a thrill. And every time I go to the Citibank machine, still the same one, I would never change machines now. I get that same, not the same thrill, but I live it like Groundhog Day again. Again, hey, you know the ch 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 you hear, hey. okay. 
<laughs> so that was ecstatically unbelievable to me. However, then by the middle of the week, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to do all the things I never had time to do. And I signed up for an Italian cooking class. And I took my first class and realized that wasn't going to do it. <laughs> I better find something else to do. Oh, but to say you can cook because, you know, I want to be a house to dinner. You, once that, we'll, we'll get that, you, you keep that story to yourself for a change, right. Miss. Right. Please. Okay, tell it. No, I won't tell it. I won't tell it. I've made up for it. I've made some good meals for you, Damon John, and you know it ever since that bad one. Yeah. It's not that you made a bad meal. You didn't make anything. You didn't make shit. You was nothing there, Barbara. Barbara, you got more lettuce. You got more lettuce on you. A little pack where you got a little bit of this, a little bit of protein, and whatever it was. I had to go down. My wife and I, our stomachs are growling. Your dog's growling at me, I think, because we thought the dog was in the room. We go downstairs. We had to eat street meat and then come back upstairs. <laughs> I knew you were going to tell that. I knew you couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I remember well, that. Like, obviously, you didn't take cooking. What else did you do after that? I got depressed. I honestly got depressed for the first time in my life. I never felt like a depressed person or that type. But I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was going. I missed terribly my team of brokers at the Corcoran Group. I had hired every one of those thousand brokers when I sold the business. Mm -hmm. I knew them. I knew their family. I loved them. Even on a bad day, I loved them. And all of a sudden, I had nobody. I had me, my kitchen, and my husband, and my dog. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I couldn't find the challenge, the excitement, the curiosity, the creativity, all the things that are involved in building a business for all of us. I couldn't find any of that in my kitchen. <laughs> it wasn't there. I just sat. Well, I mean, I mean, you 500 people. Let's say each one is making a deal a week. You got well, negotiations. You got wires, you got, oh, yeah. you got travel, you, you, you're fighting other competitors. That's super fast. That's my point, right? It's super fast paced. Now all of a sudden, okay, the money's great, right? 100%. If you're smart, you're not blowing it all. So then now all of a sudden it just goes from 100 miles an hour to five. Zero. Zero miles an hour. That's what do you do? I got depressed. I didn't know what well, to do. How long did that take, Barb? You know what I did though? I have, I'm a great logical thinker. A couple of weeks later, I sat down with my big yellow pad, put a line down the middle and I put down on the left side, everything I loved to do and work and on the right side, everything I hated to do and work, what I never liked doing. And I looked at the column and kept staring at the column of I love to do. And I asked myself, what occupations could I do that would use up those gifts that I had? And I came up with two things, start a public relations company because I was so good at it or start a marketing company because I was so good at it. But then I realized both of those businesses wouldn't give me the attention that I was accustomed to. And the mm. third thing on the list was going to the TV business. And that's why I decided to let that one win. And I started going to the studios and trying to get a job as a real estate expert because I was. And the Today Show hired me for one day a week. And that was the beginning of my new career. I made it sound easy. That effort took probably 500 rejections. My Rolodex was useless to me. And one yes, thank God, one yes, finally. Yeah. I don't think people take what you just said as serious as it's just, I want, I remember when I was first working with the Kardashians and I was at dinner with Kim. And I said, well, what do you want to do? She said, I want to be famous. I said, what? Just like that. Wow. She said, I want to be famous. And we were talking, I think she was with Reggie Bush. She's done it by far. Yeah. And she said something like, any aspect of my life, I'm going to show. A social media just coming out. And she was like, like me and Reggie, we kiss publicly. We do. I'm a very private person when it comes to those matters. And she said, I want to be famous. And I think that was... She was focused enough on what she really wanted. A lot of people want fame and or virus. It's easy to say, I want to be successful because they can go, hey, I want to be successful because I want to take care of my family. Everybody can relate to that. But for some way to say, like you just said, it wasn't giving me the attention that I wanted. Or needed. Very, it, there's not a lot of people. You may mm -hmm. say, I want to be a singer because I want to make everybody happy and sing. But few people like maybe Kim or like you would say, I want attention. Now, 
that's extremely powerful. And that's knowing your why. And I was able to get you to take all the other things out of the way. Yeah, PR, this and that. Oh, wait a minute. No, PR, I want to be the one that they're talking about. I want to be the star. <laughs> was that because you was that because you came up with a family of 10 where you needed the attention? You were very clear and it's easy to say, listen, out of 10 kids, the one who makes the funniest jokes or the one who does stand on their head gets a 10. What, what during that moment when you drew that path, what during that moment made you really, you were blatantly honest with yourself. What made you go there and be able to even say it to people? I don't know about saying it to people, but I was in touch with my feelings. When I was working my after school jobs since I was very young, I always knew how to grandstand. I always knew how to get attention wherever I went because I really needed it. When I was at the Corcoran Group, most people would say having an empire and having so many people working for you and having a brand that's well known was great. That wasn't what I found great. What I found great was the reporters calling me every day and asking my opinion. That was attention. I loved it when I saw my name in print quoted, that was attention. And I'm sure it stemmed back to my mother and father having those two, they had to share their attention with 10 kids. I'm sure I had a deficit. I, if I had seen a shrink, I probably wouldn't have been successful because I probably would have gotten over my need for attention, <laughs> but I didn't. And therefore I kept on that path. How do I get more attention? How do I grandstand? How do I get all eyes on me? I need to have them on me. It's really a sicko situation, isn't it? And not the healthiest stance for anybody, but nonetheless, that's who I was. And that's the race I ran and won. What do you think though, Barbara, about that? When you see other people as you and your mother had a great gift, do you think that not being honest with ourselves is probably one of the biggest traps that we have? we end up not living a fruitful life because you're very honest with yourself. Do you see that in other people? They're just not honest with themselves? No, you know what I think is a, a much more damaging thing that happens with a lot of people happened with me. I wasn't exempt from it, is you can't shake the old tapes that are in your head. Whatever you used to be as a kid, whatever your insecurities are, whatever stops you, whatever you second guess, it's so ingrained because it came up, it's your childhood friend that came up the ranks with you. And to change that tape is very difficult. I know, and you would know as well as I know, how hard is it to shake a tape in your head that you're a dumb kid, okay? When you're in school defined as a dumb kid, you can't read or write, people are laughing at you. You don't shake that so easily. We turn it into our advantage because we're proving the world. I know it's in you too, Damon, as well as it's in me, proving the world, you're not stupid, you're successful, you could do what you wanna do. I'm still proving it. But I think shaking out that tape getting rid of it and trying to bust through it and just be a new you and ignore that old dirty tape, I think is the biggest challenge for most of us. It has been for me. It still creeps in my insecure moments. Not that I'm afraid of being poor or going backwards in that way, because I could always get a job as a waitress. I'm a great waitress. Mm -hmm. But just the idea that believing in the way you used to define yourself, you got to get rid of that shit if you're going to move forward. And I've been successful in doing that. And I think it's very hard for people to get rid of it. It takes a lot of practice. You won't believe the tape in my head that kicks in now when I'm insecure. It used to be, oh, Barbara, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't have really tried. It's not important. That guy's not worth your time. Don't ask for anything. You're fine back at the office. You could do this. You could. I used to like back off in things I wanted to be a, a killer on and ride the horse and slay the dragon. I would back off, back off. No, then I have a great tape that says, you are hot shit. You are good looking. You are brilliant. You are wonderful. You are the cat's meow. You are... I just load it up with all this shit so there's no room for the old tape. But I think it takes a lot of practice at that to really make it your own. I really do. And I think it holds a lot of people back. I know the people I've been acquainted with is, as friends, definitely. I love the way to say that. When people want to know their why, instead of going back to their why, you go back to who that kid was and say, like you said, as a kid who came along the journey with you, you never get fully rid of that person, or maybe you extract some of the values. Now, let's go to something. I think there was a very special moment that a lot of people don't realize. Things come down to a moment. I always say, you're an amazing skier, I've been told. I know that I'll dust you on a snowboard, but it's fine, but I'm told that people practice for four years to go to the Olympics and they will practice over the, the best people in the world and they will win over milliseconds for four years of practice. It's yeah, amazing, yeah. 
it's the same as a, a it's the same as the opening of a letter. I realized the other day that I said some of my negotiations have gone on for months when all I needed to do instead of telling the lawyer this and he tells that lawyer that and she tells that lawyer that all I needed to write is the opening sentence was here's what I'm trying to accomplish. And mm. in that to accomplish, I make sure that I say, I know you're great, I know you're this, I know you're trying to accomplish this. Hey, I'm trying to do this with you. You got turned down for to come out to film Shark Tank and you wrote a great letter and it opened up to Mark Burnett with, hey, Mark, I heard you took another girl to the dance. Is that a great line? <laughs> that is an opening <laughs> line. And the story, I don't want to butcher it, but basically you you got turned down or you said that you, were, you wanted to go out there to film and you heard that you were in the runnings and you said you... You no, they that. went further. I signed a contract. They offered me the job. I signed a contract and federal oh, yeah. and send so it back over the thing. Yeah. Instead of me butchering it, tell it really quick, the story. I know this story we were told me to get into it about that. They had come back and told me after I signed the contract, they had changed their mind. They hired another woman for my job. I said, that couldn't be. You hired me. I signed the contract. And they reminded me they didn't countersign the contract. No. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and so they said they, they call me and consider me a fallback sometime in the future. That's the kiss of death. That's like being the ugly sister at a prom, right? Who wants that spot? Right. And then I sat down and wrote your email that you just referenced, and that was the first line. I understand, Mark, you asked another girl to dance instead of me. I appreciate being considered a fallback, but I'm much more accustomed to coming in first, and let me tell you why. And I said, all the best things that happened to me in my life happened on the heels of rejection. And I cited Sister Stella Marie telling me I'd be stupid because I couldn't read, write to the Donald himself who wouldn't pay me a penny of the $4 million till I beat him in federal court. Till all the old boys network saying I would never compete with them till I became their number one rival. I just cited my, 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 my five high points, I guess you call it. And I told him I'd consider coming out or I'd like him to consider taking me out to compete for the seat and I'd be on the plane on Tuesday night. And that's when you met me the next day. <laughs> he invited me out. <laughs> and I competed for that seat. And the rest of it is history as they you, you took the number one seat and we're all better for it. How did you have the emotional intelligence to write that letter? Without that letter, somebody else would have said that email would have went off as Barbara is desperate. And look at the great Barbara Corcoran. Look at the shit she sent me. I didn't give a shit what they thought, honestly. I've never, I gave up on worrying about that back when I was in school, really. You know what? I felt like it was written from an attitude of strength, which it was. Like, I cannot believe you actually passed me by. I was insulted and I was angry, and that's what got me to write it. And you know what? I really felt that they were missing the best thing that could have ever happened. It was sincere and powerful. And he heard the tone because he said to Charmin, if you remember Charmin, she was the recruiter of the town. I don't know if she approached you first. She was the one who approached me. She called me back and she said, I took your email into Mark. I made a promise to take it in. And he said, she's a real shark. What a better compliment than that. She's a real shark. Invite her out. Oh, and of course I got invited out. Do you know what? Everything I ever visualized came true. And I had a picture of me as a shark. And the idea that it wasn't going to come true didn't make any sense to me. It didn't follow the script of my life. And that's why I stood up to be counted and objected. And I did it as a lady, but with a lot of power as well. I think it was well written. I want you to know, not to tell Mark Burnett, I shot it off so fast. I probably rewrote it seven or eight times to make sure every word counted. But it looked like it was off the cuff. I just wrote it off the cuff. You know? But it turned the key. And that's all that's important. It gave me the opportunity to meet all these great entrepreneurs, great ones and not such great ones over all the years. Yeah. <laughs> and it created a whole new life for me, a whole new team of people to surround myself with, my own joy back. Barbara, you would think that when, when, when a person that has so much success and admiration that you wouldn't have to keep fighting like that, even though it's just a, it's a small fight or a big fight, you wouldn't have to prove yourself. And a lot of people think that for some reason, they just stop fighting after a while. They think they're going to get to a point of Barbara Corcoran and they're going to have to stop fighting because everybody's going to kneel at their feet. What would you say to people like that? Is your fight harder today to prove yourself because people want to bet against you because you're successful? Do people just think it comes easy to you or do people think you just don't need it? What is What would you say to people who, who you have to now say you're always going to fight? You know what I look at more than winning the fight? I'm very focused on 
uh, creating a habit of fighting and standing up for myself. I think when you create a habit of fighting and standing up for yourself, and sometimes it's not a fight, things happen if you just push a little, but I always push partially because I'm insecure and I need to have the success and always pushing, I think more than anything, so that I have the self-confidence to know that I will always push. Put me in any adverse situation and I will tell you one thing without even knowing what I'm going in to confront, that I will push harder than anybody in there because I've made a habit of it. And so that gives me a great leg up on confidence, knowing that I have the makings of an individual that knows how to push. So it's half need, half habit. But I think making a habit of that is instrumental in success. And if I didn't push next week or next month, I'd probably get away with it. Give me eight months, I'd still get away with it. But by the 12th month, I'd wonder if I lost my mojo. I'd wonder about myself. And that's the first loss of confidence. You have to push for your confidence. That's well, what I think. Amazing. And I've learned so much about you that I didn't know. I've known you now 15 years, maybe even 16 years. And so many of these little antidotes and things that have happened, I haven't realized or I didn't know, but I'm really happy that we got to know each other and you spent this moment with me to share that moment with everybody else. And I appreciate you. Damon, I just want to say to you, if you would stop complaining about that goddamn meal I made you that shortchanged you, you could hear a few more of my things that I say, okay? No, but it's <laughs> an honor to be with you. The friendships out of Shark Tank is the best part about Shark Tank. I'm sure you would agree, right? We're like in the pit together. It, it is. It is a moment in history, but getting to know great people, even Kevin, has been amazing. Oh, Kevin's a hoot. I love that, Kevin. I love hate him like a bad brother, good brother kind of thing, but I always <laughs> love you. <laughs> I love you too, bro. All right. I well, thank you, thank you for the opportunity, Damon. Real honor. Thanks for watching. I wish you love and power your life. Make sure you like, make sure you subscribe. Check you later.